Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Keith Beam, Director of Product Innovation at GSM and the new head of Cold Steel. When GSM bought Cold Steel two years ago, there was nervous speculation in the community that the knife world was about to lose a great. But GSM's Keith Beam, already a name in the archery world, entered the knife industry and Cold Steel with a great enthusiasm and an obvious fascination with the sprawling and totally unique product line he had just taken over. I had a chance to meet Keith in person at Blade Show and really look forward to continuing the conversation. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show. That helps greatly. And if you want to help uh, in a financial way, you can go over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and see what we have to offer there. Uh, again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Keith, welcome to the show. How you doing, sir? Well, it's uh, great to have you here. And one thing I, I didn't really uh, say up front, even though it's kind of in your your job title, is you're an inventor. I was trying to do a little bit of research on you, and you have been, uh, you've got quite a number of patents out there. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know for certain, but I, I somewhere around 19 or something like that. In the archery world, though, that's all based on my prior life, you know, pre-Cold Steel. Pre Cold Steel. So you come out of the archery world. Um, what's that like? And I mean, because I've I've been uh, so um, into the knife knives and the knife world for so long. Uh, it's interesting to see sort of parallel enthusiast groups. What's what's the archery world like? Well, the, the archery world has been a fascination. It's been my whole career. It's been my life. Um, Brooks Johnson and I formulated Double Hole Archery, which is the hunting blind company, the hub style hunting blind company. That carried on. We sold to Primos. Primos was sold to Bushnell, blah, blah, blah. I invented a couple new broadheads for new archery products and had a chance to work with Andy Simo, who is the rocket engineer of Apollo 7, but he was the inventor oh. of the Thunderhead broadhead, the Spitfire, and like the Quick Tune 360. And I got to work with him. Then GSM came in and purchased NAP. So now I'm into this umbrella of GSM. And we're about seven or eight companies. And my leader, the CEO, Eddie Castro, has taken this thing and exploded it. Now we have like 70 some brands, 74 brands. And we purchased Cold Steel. And they were like, we need somebody to work with Lynn, somebody that's crazy, whatever. And I might be a little older, but I'm still crazy. <laughs> You're not that old. I think we we determined we're right around a uh, very similar age. So we're, we're still young. That's what I'm saying. Um, yes. So, I mean, innovation in broadheads, that's uh, as a non-archery guy, as someone who's, you know, uh, uh, has a, a glancing interest in it. Um, I was surprised to see in those patents that there are there are things to innovate, even in terms of things as old as broadhead arrows. But then I look at the knife world and that's what's happening there, too. Knives are very old, too. Was there and was it kind of an easy thing for you to take on knives, having already done archery in that world? Well, the, the neat thing is, is I'm not, you know, I design, uh, help design a lot of our hunting products. Okay, that's my forte. And I, I, you know, I actually come from a really, really outdoors family. I had an army ranger for a dad and two brothers that were crazy and outdoors. So we've always been in this outdoors world. You know, when, when we came on to Cold Steel, you know, we had Lynn and we had Luke LaFontaine and you have Ron Balicki and these guys that really were the staple uh, part of um, Cold Steel prior to us buying them. And with that uh, came some of their design work. You match that with our design engineers out there in Las Vegas. We have a team of engineers and they are great chaotic people as well. So it's really cool. I haven't had anything really to do with the designing of the Cold Steel products. My um, bit in this gig is learn from Lynn, train with Lynn. Uh, keep the YouTube thing going, keep that that wonderful group of people entertained in chaos. 
and at that same time kind of show and uh, describe and, and demonstrate the effectiveness of cold steel. So that's my uh, part in this cold steel world. See, I still do all the audio visual for 74 brands. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're the, you're, you're the, um, uh, uh, marketing, what is it? Online marketing manager? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, video creator. Uh, yeah, that's another for it. You know, when Double Bowl was around, when we had our honey blind company, um, we had our television show uh, for 15 years. And we also, I was also the executive producer of Jay Gregory's Wild Outdoors on the Outdoor Channel. Oh. So I've been producing TV and producing video parts and segments and commercials uh, since 1993. So, how does that go into helping market cold steel? I mean, well, I, I will tell you that I'm a, a longtime cold steel fan and was really excited way back in the day when they came out with those proof videos, which I'm sure you've uh, you, you poured over and, and you've continued in that tradition with your own spin on things, um, which I really appreciate. Um, what, what is your approach to using your video skills and your producing abilities uh, to further the brand? Well, it's, it's like I said, I, I got to go out and I still go out and I, I train with Lynn and I learn from Lynn and I admire Lynn. You know, I built a company with my business partner, Brooks Johnson, and we built it up and, and then we sold it. You know, uh, he did the same thing for like 40 years. So I've got to train with these guys and it's just snippets. I, I'm not a martial arts expert. You know, I don't lie to anybody that nothing ever backfires on me about what I say. So it's one of those things that I can take what I know in the video world. I can take some of my athletic ability. I used to play pro baseball, just minor leagues, but I play college ball and, and pro baseball. So I, I feel like I'm still very athletic, even though I'm old. And I'm able to take and hopefully carry on uh, that which Lynn had started. But it's neat because when we do that, I can edit the videos. I can come down here to our studio here, piece in whatever needs to be shown or demonstrated, and hopefully keep the guys, uh, you know, entertained and yet understanding what Cold Steel is still about. Oh man, that's right about the baseball. I knew that, and and uh, your uh, saying that just brings to mind your record throwing. I mean you have really embraced the throwing of the, these many axes and tomahawks and knives. Um, and you're amazing. So how did that, what was that learning curve? Like well, I, I took the name stick man, and this is kind of a, a funny story because when we first bought, uh, Cold Steel. It was November when we closed on it. And Lynn did um, like a final kickoff video. And then it went directly to me. And I didn't own a Cold Steel knife at that time. I had a couple of custom knives that I carried hunting with me. And I got the call that said, hey, I need you to go out and just introduce GSM to the Cold Steel world. And all I had was a birch stick. And it's on my very first video. I'm out and back and I think it's snow on the ground. And I just want to say, hey, guys, I, I'm from GSM. We're going to keep things going. We're going to do things the way you want to see it. Um, nothing's going to change. But I would love it if you guys would comment on your two favorite discontinued knives and the highest votes will be brought back. OK, so that was my first video. I had like twenty seven hundred comments, like forty three thousand views and like eight death threats in a matter of <laughs> minutes so that that's amazing I, I remember that video and i remember thinking wow that is smart not only not only to come right out of the gate and and put a new face to the brand i think that that's a pretty valuable thing uh for lack of a better term to have a pitch man and and lynn thompson was an excellent one and um you came right out and not only introduced yourself, which, um, you know, is good, especially for the pearl clutchers out there. who's like, what's happening to cold steel? But also uh, that question, what are the two discontinued models? And what and, and I was one of those commenters. And of course, I said the tall wire like many. Yep. And um, my other one, and I'm, I'm wondering if you heard this a lot, the black rhino. No, not the black rhino. I think oh. the holdout uh, in the four inch. Mm -hmm. All were in the four inch and the holdout in like the three inch model. And I want to say serrated. I can't remember exactly what the top vote getters were, but, but I, I will jump back here. I kind of got off, off track. Yeah. Um, so I had this birch stick and that's all I had in my hand. 
and everybody's like, what's with the stick, man? You know, what are you, stick, man? What's with the birch stick, blah, blah, blah. And just harassed me on holding this birch stick. And so the next video, I got some knives in from Cold Steel and I decided I was going to take the commercial uh, filet knife and I would cut the skin off of a salmon and talk about our winners. OK, the two that we'll bring back and I will talk about um, our Cold Steel's line of kitchen cutlery. So I do this video. I don't have my stick. And now I've got 2,500 comments that are like, where's your stick, man? Where's your stick? You know, it's just harassing. It's fun because I, I, I've got thickest skin. You can't harm me. <laughs> so I'm laughing about this and so on. So one of the first videos I did is I threw these Templar axes and I would throw them. And my son and I were out and we were playing with them and we throw them back and forth. And I, I finished the thing off saying stick man. All right. So I threw it and I said, stick man out. And my son says, because it sticks, man. And I'm like, oh, your dad can throw things here in this in this group or this genre of blades. And I can stick a lot of them. And so I said, all right, because it sticks, man. And it has stuck, man. <laughs> How much has this obvious talent for uh, throwing knives, which is something everyone wants to be able to do, whether or not they admit it? Uh, how much do you think that helped gain you some cred uh, amongst the the uh, Cold Steel fans? I, I think it's helped immensely. It's kind of uh, cemented the nickname. I've been called, my name, last name's Beam, and I've been called Beamer my whole entire life, all right? I, I don't even, when people go, hey, Keith Beam, I don't really realize who's talking, you know, it's Beamer, and then I see it. Um, the, the stick part was one of these things that I had to, not only implant myself into this role, but I had to solidify it. And then the stick man that everybody called me just kept going there. So I think it's helped a lot that I can throw and I can throw and, and I'm, I'm not as an old man, uh, great distances. In fact, um, I'm going out later today and I'm going to try to take the Hudson Bay camp hatchet and, and surprise some people with a plus 45 yard, um, uh, throw sticking the, the hatchet 45 yards yeah these long distance throws are crazy and very impressive um you have a partner in your videos and i want to talk about her in a minute but um well actually this uh this is a good time because she's also throwing uh, amazingly well uh this is a friend of yours you, you uh what is her name again trista we call her trista. T. t that's right t um she's awesome she is a young uh, you know, attractive young woman who's got, uh, you were telling me about her uh, when I was talking to you at Blade Show. She is uh, brilliant yes. and uh, and can throw a knife and throw a hatchet. She's like what I want my, what I'm expecting my daughters to turn into. They are beautiful. They are brilliant. Yeah. And I want them to be able to throw knives and axes too. Well, it, it's really funny. Her mom is the general manager of my wife's business. And as Trista was coming through high school and being this superstar athlete with this 4.0 student and this great personality, she grew up in a dairy farm family. Okay. Tough ethics, great ethics, work hard. I mean, unbelievable and funny. And so I met her and we started about two years ago and, and she was cutting then. And now she's in her last year of college before she goes to pre-med and, or before she goes to, um, uh, OTC school and she's going to be an occupational therapist and she is <laughs> brilliant, fun and oh my Lord, talented. And not only from a power standpoint, um, but from throwing. And we have this little thing on TikTok. It's called who sticks at first. And she has been kicking my tail section. It, it seems like that. Yeah, it seems like it, man. Yeah, it was it was just a fun little game that started out. From her. She's very competitive. I'm very competitive. OK, and we are like the two most competitive. But at that same time, we're both humble enough to high five the other when they get their ass kicked. So it's um, it, it's so much fun working with her now. Unfortunately, she's going to be leaving in two weeks to go back to college and I will probably never see her in the cold steel plant again but um it's one of those things that every once in a while you got to honor what you've been blessed with and not take it for granted so we're trying our best um and and she is spectacular um the product line you just mentioned the cold steel factory and it made me think of 
everything that you walked into. Cold Steel has a massive product line. And like I said in my intro, it is 100% unique. No one is making, uh, you know, pocket knives like this besides Cold Steel. No one is making battle axes and, and many, many different specific historical swords. And uh, there's no one doing what Cold Steel does. And there's no one who ever has, probably ever will. What was it like taking on this new company and then having this vast product line? Well, the, the neat thing and what we tried to explain and what is happening is, you know, Lynn might go to the Philippines to have this item made. Uh, he might go to Hungary to have this. And that's these things that Luke LaFontaine and Lynn were working with. We haven't changed any of that. OK, so if it needs to be made in Taiwan, it's made in Taiwan. If it needs to be made, you know, the steel worked in Japan somewhere. Yes. If it needs to be built in China, it's built in China. You know, so nothing has changed that way. And I actually think that our quality is, if not exact, maybe even a little bit better. And, you know, Lynn's still involved and Lynn, uh, we send samples to him and he'll give me the shout out on things that are wrong. You know, there, there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of gears that are spinning, you know, when, when you're talking about a supply chain and knives. When we took over, people don't realize this. You know, they were like, oh, it's already bad quality. It takes like 18 months to get a knife in. All right. So we bought a company and then our orders are 18 months later. So they're coming in now. So it, it, for, for everybody to flip out is, oh, my God, I use it. That wasn't even our knife. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's 18 months in the supply chain. So, I mean, you talk about like this. I'm going to show you this. Yeah. That's the mayhem. Oh, right? man. Yeah. Okay. We talked about this. What? two ATAs or two shot shows ago. All right. And it is like two weeks out uh, and it's going to be in the OS 10. Um, then there's going to be a limited run in uh, S35 VN. But this is like one of our first designs. OK, that, that we have done and our engineers have done. And like I said, they, they are a great bunch of people sharper in attack and they understand uh, not only mechanics, but in working with Lynn and, and understanding blade design and what it's for. Um, we're a humble bunch that uh, knows that we can always learn. But but for you personally, um, you know, having an expertise in archery equipment and gear, um, and then to see sword, were you like, I got to learn swords. I got to learn spears, uh, axes. Was that in any way, um, was, was that an interesting and exciting challenge or was that like, my God, what have I stepped into? No, actually, um, it was, it was exciting. Um, like I said, this is my 30th year in the archery world or in the hunting world. So uh, teaching an old dog, new tricks, it wasn't like new tricks. It's like teaching them a whole new yard. And I went out there to Lynn and met with Lynn and all those guys and cut that first time. And I took uh, my, what my dad would call a smart stance is shut your mouth, be humble and learn. Uh, everybody's got something to teach. And Lynn has a plethora of knowledge. I mean, he's got 10,000 books in his library he's read. He's one of the sharpest individuals that I have ever met. I mean, truly sharp. Hardworking came from nothing and built himself to what he is. And there's just so much respect for that. You know, when Brooks and I had Double Bowl, when we were first starting the Hubline company, you know, you go through a couple divorces because you've getting, gotten out of the corporate world. And, and now all of a sudden, Brooks and I are living in an archery shop on the concrete floor on air mattresses uh, in the back of it, trying to start this blind company. And 18 months, not 18 days, 18 months later, after eating rice out of a Pyrex jar and having zero dollars and shooting against people in the archery range to make a dollar or two or, you know, at, this got really bad for somebody that has two college degrees, both Brooks and I, and we were execs with WW Granger. And all of a sudden we're starting this archery business, lose our wives, whatever, lose the houses. And you live in this. And you grind and grind and grind till it happens. And Lynn's story runs so parallel to that, mm. that it was one of those very, very neat, instant respect both ways. And he taught me so much and I have so much to learn. I mean, he, he's forgot more in a day than I know, um, or in, in his, you know, it, that I'll learn in my lifetime. But it's one of those things that I loved it. I, I thought it was so fun. Um, it, it's nerve wracking. And I'll tell you why. 
if you got a second. Yeah, I got a second. <laughs> All right. I wrote a book. It's called That's Going to Leave a Mark. And it is on Amazon. And it talks about being the most accident prone person in the world. And at the time I wrote the book was 2007 or eight. And I had already had like 17 surgery or 17 broken bones, like 20 surgeries, 400 sutures and a skull fracture. And since that time, I've added about 15 surgeries. I have had my back broken four places, my scapula. Oh my God. Fresh. I've been med flighted and I, I've, I've been sewn together. Now you take the most accident prone person in the world and you go, let's give him the sharpest knives in the world and let him play with them. Oh my God, man. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it, it's very funny, and at that same time, there is a massive amount of safety respect that goes into this world. Yeah, I, you know, Lynn walks with a limp. You know, he's been med flighted a couple times. You know, he's hurt himself, and it's dangerous. You know, you, you shouldn't try some of this stuff that we try at home. I don't always put a foot clamor on there, but we should. Mm -hmm. And it, it's one of those things that you've got to understand all the things that can go wrong. And so far, knock on wood. Um, I, I've listened to uh, my father and everybody else in this world and Lynn and gone you know, tell people it's dangerous. The, the, you know, there is something to having a very sharp pointed knife or sword that, that will, that will keep your focus. But when you get too used to it and a lot of us, you know, knife uh, junkie types uh, playing with knives all the time, absentmindedly. Yeah. That's when it happens. And we've all cut ourselves, but um, yeah, well, it, you know, Lynn, Lynn Thompson's been training in martial arts for 40, 50, 60 years, however yeah. long, and he can still, you know, hurt himself with these damn things. So we, we all can, and, and things can happen. I mean, you can hit bamboo and if it's not green bamboo, it doesn't matter it, unless you hit it with so much kinetic energy that you keep that momentum going. If you catch it on the side, it skips that blade off, yeah. you know, and that's why Lynn was teaching me all along, you know, step your foot out and clear yourself when you who and then luke would be like make sure your hand hits your hip and it stops that swing because you don't want hit to hit the ground not only damage your tip but things can snap and bing and, and bust and, and load up and spring i mean a lot of these things if you think about it are like like leaf springs and, and mm -hmm. they and fire at any time and so it, it's been one of those things that i try to stay um i don't want to say smart <laughs> <laughs> you got to start smart to stay smart <laughs> yeah and, and t and i've got a, a new tiktok video coming out of who sticks it first where um a gentleman by the name of soul thrower is that's his handle name on tiktok he is a uh, guy from scotland and or sweden and he is a, an incredible thrower okay and I, I all the guys like adam over there in russia and whatever i followed these guys once okay. i threw that gi tanto 43 yards everybody started contacting me in the in the throwing world and i've got to meet some of the people that i have watched their videos and god god that's so fun because you and i know it when you throw something and it sticks it is satisfying yeah i, I have never thrown anything even remotely close i i have a, a board out back an old desk that uh my daughters and i throw our three cold steel uh uh master throwers i can't remember what they're called but the big ones and they chunk so nicely. And when they do, it feels so good. But, um, you know, 15 feet is my max. And you're talking 43 yards. Yeah, it's um, and, and it, I just had uh, a gentleman come out and, and do some super fine tuning on my Hudson Bay camp hatchets. Um, oh, nice. I, I, I hit at 40, 49 yards. I beat the target up. Um, and I don't know, I, you cameras, I, I need 10 camera people out there, but I'm not sure exactly where I hit, but I know that one of them hit blade forward. And so I have had him buzz hone these things to where they shave anything. Mm. And that's the one the other night that I threw, uh, it's on TikTok. I threw 27.1 yards indoors and, um, and, and stuck it and I'm sitting there wow. going, I'm going to load up today. My son's here. It's going to be 104 degrees outside. Uh, nice and warm for the old body to, to keep it. So I'm going to cut it loose. You know, uh, we were talking about baseball and the obvious um, parallel throwing a baseball and throwing a hatchet or throwing a, 
a knife, but there's swinging the bat and swinging a sword. Is, <laughs> is, do, you, do you have, it, it, was it an easy learning curve for you to, to learn uh, cutting and that kind of thing? Well, it, it's, it's a learning curve. I don't want to say it was easy because when you hit, and I was a switch hitter in baseball and I golf right-handed. So when you hit a ball, when you hit a golf ball off of a tee, or if you hit smash a baseball, you're following through. All right. You're loading up and letting it all hang out. All right. You come back here and the bats back here, the golf clubs over your shoulder. And when I took this on, one of the first things I had to learn is you step with the other foot. Okay. Swinging is completely different. OK, I'm not I'm not I'm coming through with my hips hitting a baseball and now I'm going to step forward with this leg and kind of it, it, it's very different. Now, the crazy thing is, is you have to stop the blade. There's no big long. Mm -hmm. if you look at the greatest sword masters in the world. These guys control these swords. Foom, they're through it to Tommy Matt that stopped whatever. And I was over swinging. I, I was cutting through bamboo. And I was throwing everything I could into it. And, and Lynn and, and Luke were just working with me over and over because I over swung. And I, I can send you some footage too that will really hit this point that it took me a lot to understand. I can hit it really hard, but I have to stop it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the danger of it is where's the blade go, you know? It's one thing if your baseball bat comes around and taps you on the helmet like mine, you know, that was my my thing. I could always feel it. It's another thing when the sword taps me in the back of the head. You know? Right. I don't really want that. And, and, I, and I'm not a sword master, so. It's like the uh, edged webs, uh, edged weapons version of over penetration with firearms in, in houses and that kind of thing. You just got to be careful who's around you and and. um well, man, Ron Balicki and Luke LaFontaine uh, on top of uh, Lynn Thompson, you really jumped in with some of the best people you could possibly train with in this stuff. I, I would actually like to call them very dear friends. Uh, we hit it off great. Um, Luke is a great instructor. And Ron is one of the sweetest men that there is that as Lynn and I have talked about, and I thought Lynn might have been the toughest man I ever met. Uh, pound for pound. Uh, he said that Ron is and Ron is this quiet spoken gem of a human that uh, is like a Wolverine. <laughs> and you, it's just how fast, you know, he sit there and he works with me on disarmament. Okay. And we really haven't got into that yet. We haven't had time. You know, I'm the only one that produces these shows. I don't have a staff of five. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to pick and choose what we're going to do. And Ron and I have done like 10 hours worth of disarmament using our dummy knives, which are fantastic. And he talks about, you know, how you want to have 10 of them in your belt. So you get a rhythm and a cadence on how to knock a knife away. And he has worked with me over and over and over. And I'm dying to, to do those videos. But like I said, I'm kind of limited on my time on, on what I can kick out. Well, uh, before you held up the mayhem, and if you would hold it up again, let's take a look at that. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the new, um, oh, God, look at that. Uh, let's see, hold, slide, the, yeah. Um, there we go. That is a five and a half inch uh, clip point. It, it, it looks like a swashbuckler's yeah. knife. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this. I have uh, almost all of the XL cold steels just uh, a massive collection. And this is definitely is going in that collection, but, but this one's different. All, all of my other ones have the triad lock. Let's talk about the Atlas lock. Okay. So the Atlas lock is the lock that our engineers designed and we love the triad lock. We still work with Andrew Demko all the time. It's not a replacement type thing. It's our engineers came up with this and it's fascinating because you'll see, and I'm going to have a testing jig, um, Built, I don't know if you've ever talked to Luke at Calculated Survival. He uh, he built a jig that we saw in video the other day, and he's making me the identical thing. We're going to be able to test this in a little safer way than than I have done in the previous with a winch and, and a scale and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to find out what this in hold because the Atlas lock, the original Atlas lock, was on the engage the the first engage, and it held seven hundred and twenty eight pounds. Damn. Um, so it is a strong beast. Now, you know, they all work in unison. Anything is only as strong as its weakest link. And just to say the, the handle held up, the liner, the lock, it's like when the triad was tested, you know, and Andrew Demko is 
a friend and he's helping us and we work with him. Um, his triad lock is fantastic. The thing that I hear a lot, um, the triad lock, when you get a new triad lock, especially on a bigger knife, okay, you know, like a four max or whatever, it, it's tough to get your thumb pushed. You know, a, a man can do it. All right. But like Trista, when she does it, um, or my wife or whatever, they, they, they struggle with this. The neat thing about the engage is it, it seriously is a moving work of art right there. Now, I know there's been some people that said, oh, it'll come undone when you're stabbing and blah, blah, blah. I Can I use vulgar words on this or no? Go ahead. Okay. So there was a guy that was showing stabbing our, our engage, and he's like, it's coming loose. Well, his hand is loose and gripping. He was like, he's masturbating the knife. Oh, man. And, and, and okay, so you can hit your finger, and it will free it up, okay? Yeah. If, if your hand is sliding up and down on this. But if you're grabbing something and you're hanging on to it, I don't care if you've got the thumb grip on this thing or if you've got any grip and you're hanging out, this thing will never fail on you like that. Yeah, and I've 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 heard that um, that uh, um, criticism of a lot of different locking mechanisms. Well, if I'm doing this in my hand, I mean, I've heard that with the mid back lock, yeah. back locks that aren't way at the tail end, like the buck 110 people. Oh, it's in the middle of the handle. What if I depress? Well, man, you know, it, have yeah. some have some consciousness or have some you know idea of what you're doing with the tool in your hand a and b that's not going to happen yeah i i think what people have got to understand is there are things that happen in reality there are accidents that happen there as well and there will always be things but you know, the greatest example of it is you don't pick your lawnmower up, your push mower, and trim your hedges with it, right? Right. Okay, that just doesn't happen. That's why the guy got his arm cut off. And, and and yet you go, well, we sued Toro. What for? I mean, you're you're picking up a, a lawnmower and trimming your hedges with this, you know, 18-inch push mower. Um, when, when are you going to need 728 pounds hung from <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want it to be as strong as you can be, but let's be realistic. I mean, yeah. last time I hung an engine block from my knife, I think I, the cherry picker would probably be the way to go for that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I have nothing better around here, but I need to fix my car. So I'll just yeah. use this cold steel. Uh, so cold steel still, um, you know, there, there are a few companies who every once in a while, like Kershaw threw their hat in the ring with the Strata a couple of years ago, made a five and a half inch bladed knife uh, folder. Uh, certainly not, a, it was beautiful. I liked it a lot, but certainly not as confidence inspiring as say a cold steel, large cold steel. Um, from your experience um, in this business now and working with cold steel, uh, what do you see the value in these large folders being and and why is cold steel the only one doing it? Uh, the, the, the value in the folder is the, it does give you confidence carrying it, okay? Um, and at that same time, it's like a conflict stopper and not because you're going to cut the person in half or anything. You know, you snap open, you got the pocket catch on that a spot XL there. Yeah. So you snap that thing open and lo and behold, people, unless they're carrying a gun, are going, I don't want to mess with that. And it's just that security of knowing that if you ever get in that situation, if things ever get bad enough where... I need to get myself out of here. That's when you go to weapons. You know, I have a, one of my very dearest friends is a Green Beret. And he will always talk about it. The first thing you do is run, you know, get out of that situation. If you can't get out of that situation, his motto is make enough space that he can go to his weapons. Lynn is armed and we uh, always carry like an EDC that you want to be able to a get out of the situation run b defend yourself if you're in that situation and i think the big knives swing that aura um if i was to think about you know like baseball and put it into an example you know in college uh, we used aluminum bats and all of a sudden easton comes out with this new bat with a bigger barrel on it and when you step to the plate, even though you can hit everything with a wiffle ball bat, when you get to that part of your life, you got this barrel now and you're like, 
I am defending this plate. You know, you're not <laughs> throwing anything past me. And 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 that's the thing is is bigger is better up to the point of diminishing return. Sure. And and I don't think we've found that. I think uh I think seven and a half inches. I, I don't know, maybe it doesn't need to go larger than that. That the XL Espada I want seems a, fold, a, fold, a true folding machete with like three V steel. I want like a Gurkha Kukri oh, yeah. at folding. Well, this this is what um, this is the other purpose. I, I love them for um, I I have always approached knives from a weapons first perspective. That's just not not because I'm some sort of warrior, but just that's just my interest. You know, always has been, and so I approach these large cold steels for their weaponness. But I've also argued that they are great for backpackers for anyone who might want a large knife. Like you, you're talking about the large holdout with serrations. What a great knife. It's so thin, so light, throw that in a backpack and you have, um, you know, a small machete yeah. that will, that will do, you know, light brush clearing, but it's fits in that small, small package. Yeah. yeah it, and that's kind of like the archery world, you know, we're trying to get arrows lighter and lighter and, and everything lighter and lighter so that they go faster and they're, they're, they're easier and they're better performing and whatever so that they fit everybody's um, world. And that's what you run into with backpacking and stuff like that. You know, what do you need for bushcraft? You know, do, do you need, uh, are you going to be really, you know, feathering wood when you're out there? You already have your logs, your wife bought a little bundle of firewood or whatever, you know, so you just kind of got to kind of match up your scheme and what you're trying to achieve and bring that with you. So buy a lot of cold steel and then you have like a variety. You know, I, I well, I could agree with you there, but it would make me look biased. Uh, you, uh, some interesting stuff, um, but of course I am. Uh, some interesting stuff uh, about steel. Um, steel is, uh, uh, you know, uh, cold steel went through a phase uh, before GSM where they phased out their OS 8A, Japanese steel that was, um, they just pushed to the limit. They made, they got great results from that. Uh, from that steel, even though it's considered kind of uh, um, uh, entry level. And then they uh, went to XHP steel and then S35, I think, because XHP became very uh, hard to get. Yeah. Um, what is your approach to steel? What are your feelings about steel? Um, and, and the reason I ask this is because I've recently seen outdoor knives that uh, are from cold steel that are selling at uh, Walmart in in blister packs. And I, and I thought, I thought, what steel is it? And it's 3CR. And ordinarily, I'd say 3CR, that's like 8CR, only five worse. Uh, but <laughs> but I have done a lot of testing with 3CR with um, Rough Rider knives and some very inexpensive uh, outdoor knives. And it's amazing steel for that sort of high impact, um, low cost, high impact steel. It, tell me a little bit about the materials and, and how you're approaching that. Um, because the materials equal uh, cost, I would imagine. Oh, and it, it, that, that you're 100 um, percent correct there. And from a cold steel branding and an explosion of branding of the cold steel, uh, you run into those times. And I know that uh, learning what I have and understanding Lynn's love and, and admiration for the company, uh, you know, the, the blister packs at first kind of go, whoa, what ha what's happening? But that's how you have to display those so they grow that brand. OK, so the steels really haven't uh, changed. They've got our engineers are working with. Uh, I've got a gentleman that is our brand manager, Jamin Horst. Great guy. He's dealt with overseas. He's on phones with them every night from, you know, the heat treating to the quenching to all this stuff. And he's talking to him constantly. And his job is a long day extended because I start calling him at eight in the morning. And of course, he's talking to somebody and somewhere overseas um, that might be 10 o'clock at night. And he's he came from the, the knife arena. So he understands blades and he understands this. You know, it, it's I, I love Joe X and, and I've had a few uh, emails back and forth. And he's like calling me out on the, the whatever. I think it was Laredo Bowie or something like that. And 4034, just your stainless steel. All right. And he's like, that didn't stick, man. What's 4034? I mean, you, you got to kind of understand exactly like you did that what steel is being used for what? 
Okay. Um, same thing with Luke, he calculated uh, survival. Him and I went over it and, 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 you know, he's great at testing everything the same. And that's what you want to do if you want to benchmark things. But from a user standpoint, you got to go, what am I going to do? Do I need a Gurkha uh, mm -hmm. Cooper machete and 3V uh, to go out on my camping trip where I'm going to cut some willows or whatever? And me and the kids are going to willow or uh, uh, whittle. Or do I need just the, the high carbon steel machete, you know, for 30 bucks and I'm going to do the same thing. And that's the problem with everybody. It's not an automobile. You know, it's not, are you going to have to pass at high speed? Are you going to have to brake fast? Are you going to have to accelerate? Uh, does mm. it have, you know, it, it's, it's, there are facets to it that give you variances, but you also have to, put that in its actual spot that it belongs. Yeah. And, and we um, probably not just in the knife world, but we tend to get attached to materials and, and how much they cost. I mean, steel is a big thing with knife people. And um, you, you want to feel like, well, if I'm being charged $200, say in 2023, I expect such and such a steel. Uh, and, and it's, it's, I, I get it because people want to get the maximum for their dollar. But um, one of my longest uh, running cold steel knives is an old roach belly, you know, that I bought for 12 bucks. And it's that 4116 Krupp steel that has been changed to 4034, I think. Um, but in, in any case, a soft substandard steel, you know, that that people look down their nose at. But that thing is an amazing knife and it's the, the heat treat on that is what really wins the day. Cause that thing has been, has been just a workhorse for years and years and years. And yet it's not some expensive steel. Well, and I think you got to ask yourself too, how do I want to touch this up? How do I want to resharpen? Am I super good at it? Am I going to sit all night on, on a whetstone and, and really hone this thing for five hours? Or do I need to just touch it up so that I can keep cutting twine out there at, at my hay, you know, in, in the farm? So it, it's one of those things that, again, you know, how, how likely are you to resharpen it? What's it need to do for you? What's the main cause of it? Yeah, you want to have always an acceleration clause in there, right? I, I'm normally going to cut twine with a pop staples at the barn, blah, 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 feed the cattle, so on and so forth, or, or work on cars. But I may have to pry. I might have to use it. So then you start thinking a little better steals. You know, give yourself that room in there. Don't just max it out. But it, it's like towing. You know, um, my truck might tow 13,000 pounds, but I don't think I'd ever put it on there. Right, right. So of of these, um, the different kinds of products, cold steel cells, there are EDC knives, there are the, the big knives we were just talking about, all the outdoor things, the axes, the historical swords and such. What what are your favorite, um, what's your favorite line and, and you know, what, what do you find yourself most drawn to? Um, I, I carried the, I think it's the Raja 2 um, for a long time. I like the Andrew Demko pocket catch, okay? Not for mm -hmm. defense reasons so much is one of the things throughout my crippling myself is I don't have feeling in this finger. And I had five surgeries on my ulnar nerve. I think you can see the scar right here. Mm -hmm. it, they replaced my or moved it at transposition. Uh, I have no feeling in these bottom two fingers, all right? So you won't see me snap them blades open very often because i can't feel this part of my hand when i squeeze things i can see that i have white knuckles and i'm holding on to it so like if i'm cutting with a sword i look down at my hand and make sure this wrapped around because i can't normally tell what these two things are doing oh, okay. so um i'm a little bit different than everybody we have a, a new knife that will be here um i want to say in a week or two um we, we just did the video for it that i have fallen absolutely in love with and I like fixed blade knives because of my dexterity. Okay. I'm 58 years old and I'm, I'm down 70 or 30% of my digits. Okay. So it's one of those things I've hurt myself enough times to know that this is what, what I've got to do. So I, I love the Andrew Demko, that, that pocket catch, because if I'm cutting a box or something, I can pull it open, you know, and I wear tactical pants all the time. They're reinforced in those areas. Yeah. You'll right. really means up if you did it over and over and over and over. But I like it because I can snap it open and cut. I can snap it open and use it with one hand. And I'm not good with flicking a knife open because there's a video that Tristan and I did with our bloopers. I, I do the holdout, the long holdout, and I like snap it open and it's like gone. And her and I are laughing. 
like out of my hand. And I, I'm like, yeah, so I'm not this guy that is super cool with his knives and spinning them around and flipping them open. If you gave me a butterfly knife, I would just go to the emergency room. Like, I just, I promise you, it, 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 I'm not supposed to deal with things like that. So like my favorite knives, I, I, I have the tall wear, the new four inch that came in. I mm -hmm. love that. Um, the, that Raja and can I show you a new knife? Yes, please. All right. So this is the Republic. Okay. And that's this little gem here. It's kind of, uh, it's Ooh. stained with uh, red for me cutting the gel dummy and so on and so forth. I've abused the daylights out of this one right here, but it's the Republic. And I think if I go like that, you can see that. All right. Nice. This is S35 VN. It's an ion bonded coating that's on this it's got wonderful jimping okay and, and it's got this little i i like it for my finger so i can you know if i'm if i'm field dressing a deer or i'm caping the, the cape out so i want to mount that deer I, this is the knife this is 100 made in america okay nice. and it is heavy duty and it is beautiful it comes with its leather sheath and it is not lightweight like it won't work for everything it's like it's real, but it's not heavy, heavyweight. I have fallen in love with this. Uh, once we uh, release the video, I will be carrying this forever. Turn it around um, and in the sheath and just let us see a nice shot of it right there. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I love the sheath. And and so this is a full tang fixed blade, not something Cold Steel does too many of. Um, it, that's beautiful. That, so is that micarta? And uh, you said it's S35VN. It's a Man. bonded coating on this thing that gives it that beautiful black uh, finish on it that is tough as nails. It's the same that's used for um, firearm dippings and stuff like that. So it, it's a, it's a serious coating. And uh, is this an in-house design from some of your uh, talented in-house designers? <laughs> I would be lying if I said anything. I think our engineers came up with this early, but I don't want to discredit anything Lynn had been doing either. Gotcha. I, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank. Um, I'll call it my age, but you, you won't, you won't catch me in a lie. So I, I, I won't say, oh yeah, we did. No, I, okay. I, I don't have that answer. I, I, uh, the reason I ask is, uh, is that full tank thing? I was wondering. Oh, maybe that, maybe it's a new direction. But uh, again, you've got a classic, um, classic lines in this knife, like a, like a classic cold steel, um, but it's got a unique look of its own. It, almost a clip point, but a drop point. I, I say almost a clip point because it's hard to hard to tell, but uh, really nice. Shape. Now, have you tried throwing this one yet? No. <laughs> um, it, it's one of those things that there's there's a, a hidden Easter egg of life. Um, that's all I'm going to give you guys on that knife. <laughs> gotcha. okay, that's, that's it. You guys have to figure out what the hell that meant when I said that. Okay. Um, but I I it would throw good too. Uh, that's, that's the other thing. Oh, oh really? Um, I, I really think that I could throw this very well. It's very balanced. And I, I just haven't, I, I, I haven't said, it. Oh God, I have to, no, I will. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I you think stick man would throw that thing. Yeah. Well, I know, I know that uh, throwers such as yourself find it hard not to just pick everything up and see if it'll stick. Uh, <laughs> um, so interesting uh, project that um, I became aware of oh, a little while ago is the Jimmy Slash Chopper. I think that is such a great um, thing for Cold Steel to be. Oh yes, to be bringing to market because. Um, Man, if anyone, any production company is going to make an awesome chopper, it's going to be Cold Steel. Tell me about uh, this collaboration. Well, Jimmy Slash, I found him on YouTube when we first started off, and he was always doing reviews on Cold Steel. God love him. He was buying them and, and doing them. They were purely unbiased. And, and I just formed a relationship with him. Um, he's one of the kindest people in the world, and him and his wife are absolutely probably the salt of the earth. If you were ever to say there are two people that I truly love, uh, we're family now. And I, I stay in contact with him. He's worked all the blade shows with me. Um, but he was in these chopping competitions and he just happened to mention it to one of our engineers that was at the blade show that, Hey, you know, cold steel needs to come out with that. Cause a lot of these custom choppers, you know, $1,400, $1,500, $2,000, whatever. And it would be kind of fun because people could start a 
get into the sport and do it for a, a reasonable price. And so there was a collaboration there between the designers, well, between our engineers and Jimmy, and to come up with this perfect, and I mean, it is perfect. And there'll be a new video that comes out. You already seen the video. By the time this releases, I will have launched the, the chopper video. So you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, Trista and I, um, or T and I, ran the gamut with it. We build our own little course here. Oh, nice. It is, it is so much fun. It's 3V steel. Okay. Yeah, I think it's 28.3 ounces. It's Blade Sport certified. Um, it has the Crayx really good tacky grip on it. Of course, the lanyard hold you have to have. And, and a nice, very, very nice leather sheath. Um, it, it's this unit right here. Yeah, that's beautiful. And this thing, um, the first thousand, I don't know if you can see that or not. That's real. You can see Jimmy Slash's signature on this. Yeah. Okay, now wait. I'm going to try to do this. You see a number under that right there? Um, no, I do not. I see that there is one under the J, it looks like, right? Yeah. Okay. The the first thousand are serialized. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I, I don't have number one or number two. I'm number 20. So that tells you where I'm at in the higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. That's cool. I love the leather sheath. Uh, one thing uh, that, that I miss uh, uh, and they got rid of these a long time ago. Are the are the leather sheaths on the Laredo and on the Natchez? I have the Laredo with the leather sheath, but I was late on the Natchez. Uh, I do miss those leather um, leather sheaths, but I think for real practical purposes, Kydex or or um, Securex is the way to go. Yeah, I th I think it's a safety thing. I, I agree with you one hundred percent. I love leather. She's probably why I fell in the, in love with this Republic. Um, I I think from a, a safety standpoint, from a production standpoint, from a, a growth and production standpoint, um, it's really hard to beat. You know, and from weight and, and some other things. So there's trade offs with everything. You know, That's, yeah. how much do you think? Uh, or how much was the GSM purchase of Cold Steel or rebranding, if at all? Um, about the only thing that truly happened um, was we we worked on the logo. We have a graphic um, and VP of graphics in our catalog that really came out with the, the new cool logo on it. And uh, you'll see on the openings of the YouTube video, um, it, it's it's a beautiful tip of a knife um and it's one of those things that it was neat to put kind of a um a freshing logo but not changing the company logo if right. you're following me there because that that's the the problem with things and people and, and we're well aware of it you know we we have 74 brands so we don't come into everybody and call them all gsm you know gsm's the umbrella um we, we keep that which is appropriate and, and works. Um, so to rebrand Cold Steel wasn't necessarily the, the rebranding, um, more as some graphic changes on the logo and keeping kind of all the manufacturing, the production, the supply chains, all the same. Um, and if, if you ever called me rebranding, I would find that as a great compliment because I'm 58 years old. So if, if, if I, I'm the new thing of whatever cold steel, <laughs> you call me new branding. I love that. <laughs> I'm like an old brand that, that got painted into something. No, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I think it's been a very good transition. Um, you know, there's a lot of admiration and there always will be, um, I've been through it. Lynn's been through it. Uh, Ron Balicki, you know, you, you talk to these people that have really put themselves through a, a lot of, I don't want to say suffering, but a lot of hardship, a lot of blood, sweat, equity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they come out of it and make something out of it. There's a respect there that I don't think a lot of people truly understand. You know, Lynn was talking to, about in, in the Philippines and, and talking about growing up and this, that and the other thing and in all of his martial art training. And still to this day, the man is a machine. Oh, yeah. Got Luke over there, Ron over there, and he is training constantly. And you have to because like, again, I'll go back to it. You swing a baseball bat. That's fine. 
Okay, your rib cage will stretch, your hips will stretch, your hip flexor. Okay, but now swing at that same speed and then stop it. And one of the craziest things is, and it's hard on me, is, is you feel tissue tear at, at, at my age, swing as hard as I do and then lock it up. Okay, slam on the brakes. You know, when they test cars, they go, how fast is zero to 60 and how fast can it come down? Okay, this is like an instant stop. And when you hit things and it, it is crazy hard on your body and, and people, I, I would love to take everybody out there, give them the three inch, 200 pound cardboard tube and give them a semi long weapon. Okay. Maybe a machete or something, um, or a marauder and, and go cut it. <laughs> and when they hit it, all of a sudden they realize that their wrist ligaments just got stretched and it stopped and it stopped it and it hurt their shoulder and it hurt their back. And it is brutal. It, it, it really is. I, I will hit a thousand baseballs a day in a batting cage. And if I swing five times with a katana hard at a hog, I will feel it the next day. Like I've never felt it. And it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that people always go, you know, it's kind of like when we were in the hunting industry and we had our television show, you've got the greatest job in the world. You know, you get to do this. Let me tell you what seven days at 24 below zero, <laughs> you yeah, get right. one minute of footage that you see on the TV show. Yeah. You come out there with me and you do this, you know, you pee in a bottle and watch your bottle freeze. Okay. So on and so forth. And then you get this one minute and, and then that's it. When you go back and you build the show, that's it. But for seven days, you frostbite yourself. And it's like when I'm out with Lynn, we train for three or four days cutting everything. Oh, yeah. Piece it together into a five-minute compilation video. And you can't even explain how you feel. I mean, I was icing myself. First time, first day with Lynn, he cooks this dinner. And, and I, I'm sitting out there with him and Rob Lee. I'm in a launcher. I have a giant ice pack. His wife is so, <laughs> his wife, Bree. She's like bringing me ice bags. I got an ice bag. Look like I just got him pitching a game. Got one on my knee. I got one on my lower back there. I'm oh sitting my God. There like this going, oh my God, do I hurt? And we got to do this two more days. And it, it's, it's crazy. And it's the stopping. You know, you take a hog head yes. and hit it full blast with a two-handed Chinese sword or a two-handed sword. And have it stop you, all right? It, yeah, and those those uh, those rolls you're talking, those cardboard rolls, are no joke. You hit those with a knife, and it's like hitting a log. It is. That's the toughest thing I think that we deal with. You know, the gel dummy is a ballistic jelly, so it, it it's supposed to stop a bullet at high speeds, right? So it grabs the blade. Okay, there's no sweet sliding through it like that. Right. That kind of does it, but you you transfer all your shock. It sh it takes the shock. The cardboard tube goes whoop. Yeah. Unless you hit it hard enough to go through it, and then you're right back to that same thing I was talking about. In order to get enough speed to go through that cardboard tube, you have to slam the brakes on so that you don't do anything bad on the backside of it. Yeah, and you got to use your weight to get through too. So you're stopping your whole weight going into the ground. Yeah. Um. So it seems like in selling cold steel and uh, it coming to you. It's, it's like a really good fit. I've seen uh, in, in a number of instances, brands sort of rebranding and bringing people from outside. Uh, you know, you're, you're in a parallel industry. You were in a parallel industry in archery coming into knives. You know, it's not like you were in fashion and then came into knives or, or like, I'll just rebrand anything. Yeah. And I've seen that happen with some knife companies to some success, but um, I think that this is a real, it just seems like a, a winning combination where, uh, you know, uh, uh, just to wrap up here, where do you want to see cold steel going in the future? What, what, uh, kind of trajectory do you see for the company? I, I love the word preeminent. Okay. And, and I think that's what Lynn built. And I think that's what we need to continue. And we want to be above and beyond, um, whatever's been done. You know, I was raised by my father and my mother. And one of the things that they said to me was every day you do something that makes it a little better, the world a little better than the day before. And I think we have to do that with cold steel. And I think we do that with all of our brands to be truthful. It's a really cool company as far as leadership, as far as diversity, um, the plethora of uh, brands that we have and the variety from fishing to hunting to cutlery. 
Okay. And I think that our, our leader and the, the lead team on this pushes the envelope every day. Um, we come up with things. Some are good, some are bad. You know, you test, you forgive, you forget, you move on. But you have to have that goal. And, and I think that's why I've kind of had fun with this is because I know what it is when somebody takes your company and they've done it with mine and they buy it and you get this wonderful payout. And then all of a sudden the quality starts going down. Um, and that happened. And it was happening at a very quick clip. And we, my company was the best of the best. All right. It was the preeminent hunting blind company. I use that word again. Sorry, but we were, we were the best of the best. And when Primos first bought us, quality started going down. So I had to, you know, we, we jumped overseas. Everything was made in America. Now I'm over there and now it, it, it came back and I had to go over there and meet with people. But when I sat down with Lynn, that's one of the things that him and I hit so well together on was Lynn, I understand. And it's my goal not to let this happen. Okay. It, it's my goal. Now I'm not the, the deciding factor of all this. I, I'm just a guy that does the videos and whatever, but I transfer information to them. You know, I, I I'm not a senior VP. I, I'm, I'm who I am. And I keep letting them know when I see things. Lynn lets them know when he see Luke too. Luke is great at, at quality uh, uh, inspection. So I think as long as we have that goal, that we will always strive to make it better, I think we'll be a okay. And I, I love the comments on the YouTube uh, channel, the, the ones that, that bring a good constructive criticism. Um, and there are things that we have learned from that that take us to a new level. And that's what we have to do. You can never be stubborn enough to say, oh, I can't learn anymore. You know, that, that's why Lynn read 10,000 books in his library, it's <laughs> because he wants to keep learning. And, and, and that's how I was brought up. And I think we just hit it off well that way. Well, I'm happy to say uh, that I feel like Cold Steel is in great hands. And uh, uh, man, it, you can really, it's easy to take something for granted, like a company that makes products you like. Who knows? They could just go away. And I think we were all, um, you know, pretty, pretty stoked about how things turned out with Cold Steel. I know I am. Keith Beam, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, but, but fleshing out our conversation that we started a month and a half ago. It's been a pleasure, sir. Peace. Thank you very much. Take care. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Stickman Keith Beam of Cold Steel. Uh, really uh, excited to get a chance to talk to him and and uh, you know make sure that that our baby Cold Steel is uh, is going to go into. The, oh God, I can't believe I just said that. But we we all love Cold Steel. Very happy to see that they're in good hands. Um, be sure to join us again here next week on Sunday for another great interview, and uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And then, of course, Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.